This is Joan Walseth Purcell on July 10th, 2022 at 3 p.m. in the afternoon Eastern time, 1 p.m. Mountain time, and I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. First, let me thank you for adding to the oral history collection of the Washington Museum and Cultural Center, which is located in Worland, Wyoming. We have two goals. First, that our class of 1960 tells what life was like for kids and teenagers in Moreland from about 1941 to 1960. The second goal is that we share how growing up in Moreland impacted our adult lives. So I'm speaking with Kathy. Kathy, will you tell us your full name? It's Edith Catherine Haley. And what were you called growing up? Kathy. That's what I thought. Where are you now making this recording? I'm in my office, my home office in Washington, DC. I might, add, I might add that I was named after both of my grandmothers, Edith Haley and Catherine Omenson. Wow, that was a big... That was a big name to live up to. It was, it was, um, yeah. Um, if you, your family has been in Wyoming for a number of generations. Would you talk a little bit about your grandparents and how they come, came to be living in Wyoming? Well, it was my great grandfather, Haley, that first went into Wyoming. He, he was uh, in Ogden, Utah, and was in a, a sheep business with his brother-in-law, Adam Patterson. And they took a lot of sheep into the Bighorn Mountains from the Red Desert in Wyoming, north of Utah. Uh, they took a lot of sheep in six weeks after the Johnson County War. So I think my great-grandfather was a kind of a tough guy. Sounds like it. And what about your grandparents then? Okay, so uh, my grandfather Haley's oldest brother, uh, Pat, named after, after his father, uh, went into the business, into the sheep business with the father. And my grandfather went to MIT to become a mining engineer. Both of his grandfathers had been miners, but they weren't being engineers. They were the pick and shovel guys down in the mines. And when my grandfather, wow. when my grandfather was at MIT, he met my grandmother who was living a privileged life of a rich young girl in, in Boston. After an eight year courtship, it took him a long time to persuade her to get married. They moved to, he moved her to Buffalo, Wyoming. She wrote lots of letters home to her mother. This is kind of like a little ad, but, but I wrote this book of her, of her letters with some script in it about narrative in it that I wrote, putting some context. That was an interesting. I've read a number of those letters. I haven't finished it yet. What about your mother's family? My mother's family? Oh, well, then how the Haley's got to, to Worland. They were oh, over I'm in sorry. They yeah. were yeah, they were over in Buffalo. The two brothers didn't get along, the wives didn't get along. And the luckiest thing in the universe happened, which is their father died in May of 1919 when the World War I was still booming and there were millions of people who needed wool garments, uh, maybe 4 million men in uniform, something like that, that needed wool. <clears throat> so the price, and they also needed meat. So the price for sheep was very, very high. And the father died and boom, they split the partnership immediately sold out and the brother moved back to Ogden and my grandfather and his family moved to Denver for a couple of years to look around and see 
where to move. They decided on Worland because the irrigated beet lands were opening up. The, there was a sugar factory which had been built with Utah, uh, Utah money. So I think the father might have been involved somehow in that because he was involved in some sugar trading. Uh, anyway, in 1922, 100 years ago, they moved to Worland. My grandfather bought into the First National Bank. There were just the two First National at the time and Stocker State Bank. And then First National became the Farmer State Bank. And I don't know what it's called now. But anyway, my grandfather was involved in that bank. And uh, so he moved over the, my uncle Alec, the older, Alec Jr., Alec Haley Jr., my grandfather, that was his name, Alec Haley, and my dad, Dan Haley. And in 1924, they adopted two girls from the state orphanage who were originally from the Sheridan area. And they very strongly, they wanted a daughter. And my grandmother got down there to adopt the one and found that the older one had been adopted as a kind of companion, maybe kind of a maid companion to a girl in Sheridan. And it hadn't worked out, so she'd been rejected and sent back to the orphanage. And my grandmother called my grandfather and said, may I adopt both of them? And he said, yes, of course. So that's how we ended up, I ended up with two aunts that I didn't know until my late twenties weren't blood, my blood aunts. I didn't know they were adopted. Wow. Anyway, I'll get back to that part of the story in a minute. It's all in the book. <laughs> My mother's father and mother, um, he was from, he was born in Ukraine and the family immigrated to Philadelphia. He dropped out of school when he was 14 because his father died and he is the oldest had to make some money. So he became a cigar maker because that I don't know if you remember from our US history classes where we actually learned these things in fifth grade. Uh, Samuel Gomper started the first union, which was for cigar makers. And my grandfather said it was like having a diner's club card because you could borrow money from one union in one town and pay it back after you'd gone to another town, then you could pay it back. So my grandfather was following the horse races and then his jockey started to lose. And then somehow he ended up in California. He tried to get into San Francisco after the earthquake, but because he had soft hands, because he was a gambler, they wouldn't let anybody in that wasn't going to be working with pick and shovel and building the city. So he went back to Reno and then he lost his cigar factory in a bed on the Great White Hope. Hmm. And then somehow or another, he ended up in Douglas, Wyoming. And he had a pool hall, made cigars. Um, and my grandmother was from a farm in Iowa, corn farm. And after she was the youngest in the family. And after her parents were both gone, she ended up in Denver, at St. Joseph's Hospital and became an RN. And she was sent up, she went up to Buff to not Buffalo, to Douglas to uh, do private nursing for someone and met my grandfather. And then she went back to Denver and suddenly they were married. It was a big surprise to the community. So they were kind of an improbable couple. Um, Sounds like it. I find it interesting that both of my grandmothers came from the earliest Europeans to the United States. My grandmother Haley with the Mayflower and my grandmother Omenson uh, 
with the Dutch that went into New York in maybe 1657. And they both wow. married immigrants or son, sons of immigrants. And both from uh, backgrounds that were quite looked down on. So I think, I, I think my family and I represent uh, the story of America with this mix, this mix of people. So about 1924, my grandparent Omensons, my grandmother hated that he had the pool hall and they loved to take vacations in Thermopolis. So they sold out and moved to Thermopolis. And first they bought the Plaza Hotel in the state park and then they bought the Carter Hotel. And the, the hotels were complimentary. The Plaza Hotel was a, a kind of a residential hotel where people would stay longer for the, the hot springs treatments where their arthritis and things. And then my grandfather's hotel was a commercial hotel where people would stay short times. And it had, I think, some of the best food in the Bighorn Basin. They had really excellent food. Hmm. And one of those is still there, right? Yes, the Carter Hotel was torn down. Um, you know, Wyoming, the thing about Wyoming that's interesting is that everybody's one to two degrees of separation. The people who bought the Carter Hotel from my mother, because my grandfather had passed by then, no, he hadn't passed, but he had dementia. Anyway, they bought it from my mother. Um, it was the daughter of the ranch foreman at our ranch, the grown daughter. So this is, and this is something that I think is going to be woven throughout this interview is how overlapping people in Wyoming are. So not just uh, people like me whose family have been there for so many generations, but newcomers, if they become active, if they do things, if they're involved in their community, and to become involved in your community is usually to become involved countywide, district-wide, statewide, you pretty soon are connected to about everyone. A small state. Um, so, where did you you live, Kathy, in Moreland? Well, first we lived in a house that we rented from my grandfather and grandmother Haley. Uh, it was right next to where uh, the McClellan House is, and has been for. I don't know, since 1910 or 1920 or something. It was right by, it was on Culbertson Avenue, two blocks from Main Street, right on, uh, right by 9th Street. And I was thinking, I was thinking about my neighborhood and what my neighborhood was like. And I didn't feel it was constrained. I had no sense of being constrained in it. But there are things that looking back astonish me. So we were right next to 8th Street and my grandparents were on Culbertson on 10th Street, one block south of Culbertson on 10th Street was Grace Avenue and that's where Joni Culbertson lived. And right across the street from Joni Culbertson were my cousins, Sandy, Timmy, and Diana. Sandy was about six months younger than I am. Diana was older, Timmy was younger. And then my best friend was one block north on 10th Street from my grandparents' house. So, and then Ricky, Rick Hake was living with his parents and grandparents in his grandparents' house right next to my friend, Eleanor Dent, my best friend. So the odd thing is I only looked east. Turns out Lane Bailey was on the other side of 8th 
8th Street on Culbertson, a few blocks away. I mean, not a few blocks, a few houses. I had no idea she lived there. I played with the kids in the houses next door, Joni Culbertson, my cousins, and Eleanor Dent and Rick Hake. And sometimes my mother would drive me to visit her friends who had a daughter my age, Judy Van Buskirk. And it seemed like it was, a, and it was at the far end of town on the north. And I think it was Pullman Avenue and it could have been 14th or it could have been 15th. But Judy and I were so astonished because there was an old lady on the corner next to them who had an outhouse. We just couldn't believe there was an outhouse in town. But we oh, knew it she had outhouses. And it was in use. Yes. Oh, okay. But that was that was that was my neighborhood until and I know I went to the library. The library was on 10th in the old courthouse, in the basement of the old courthouse. And I know I was walking there by myself by the second grade because I started reading Nancy Drew about the middle of the year. And I became frightened with, this, with the mysteries and you know all these scary things that would happen. I became afraid to go down in our cellar <laughs> by myself. <laughs> so, um, and then the other linchpin in my neighborhood, and I think about downtown, there were all these shops and so forth. So I didn't think anything about that, but I think my two fantasy, my, I must have lived, in, lived for fantasy because the Kirby Theater had a matinee every Saturday that was a cowboy show. And every Sunday they had a glamorous, wonderful movie like Doris Day dancing on tabletops, or Helen of Troy, or Prince of Thieves, <laughs> are these wonderful movies. And if it was a Doris Day movie, I would, oh, I'd go to both. I'd dance my way home to 809 Culbertson. And, and, and I was thinking about these movies because they always had the same sequence preview of coming attractions, then a cartoon, then time, time of the week. What was it called? Time of the week, I think. And those were the newsreels. And to this day, when I think of India, I think of all the news when we were little where the Indians, the Hindus, and the Muslims separated into India, and the, a lot of the Muslims were forced into Pakistan, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, and then East Pakistan became Bangladesh. And then Hindus in those parts of the country were forced to go to uh, India, and there were millions and millions shouting, screaming, blood running down their faces, things being blown up, assassinations. To this day, the thought of going to India, which I've been once, I can't get those images out of my mind from, from all those time of the week. Do you remember one thing? Do you remember any of the... Um, shorts that had the military operations going on during World War, World oh, those, War II. That was time of the week. Yeah. Those, those little short black and white news mm -hmm. things. I don't remember the war. I remember Big Quamoy and Little Quamoy where the uh, um, what was his Sun Yat-sen nationalist troops in China were fighting the Russian, uh, I mean, the Chinese communists with the Mao people. And they were on these two little islands and they had these kind of World War I tin hats and cannons that they would shoot on wooden caissons. So that was my impression of China also. But I don't remember so much, oh, I guess there would have been the Korean War once. <laughs> 
Yeah, mm -hmm. Korean War would have been in those. Um, what about March of Time? Yeah. March of Time. That was what they were called. March of Time. Okay. Um, what about downtown? What do you remember about downtown Warren, the business section? I remember lots of stores and the Kirby Theater and the library. Those were my main, my main hangouts. Okay. Um, what about the area surrounding Warland? Um, the back roads, the mountains, the badlands. Do you have a picture of those in your mind? Oh yeah, really strong. I wonder, I think, don't you think most of us had a very large space, personal space that we felt. So it wasn't just the town of Orland. I think a lot of people went up to the Bighorns to get out of the heat in the summer. They'd go up for picnics in the, or swim in, in Meadowlark Lake or something to cool off in the, uh, in the summer months. For me, a lot of things, my space probably was about an hour in every direction. So my grandparents built a cabin, had built a cabin up on the Bighorns and Rick Hake's grandparents built a cabin right next to it. And then Frank Watson eventually, years later, built a cabin. Uh, he was the superintendent K-8 superintendent but we'd go up to my grandparents cabin um and then our ranch was in the absorcas so it was the headquarters ranch was about an hour to the west then my aunt and uncle my dad's sister lived about it lived in grable so that was about 40 minutes or an hour and then my grandparents were in thermopolis and we went down to thermopolis a fair amount that was a pretty big area, if you look. <laughs> for, it for, was. Uh, surrounding our small town. Uh, did World War II affect your life? Oh, huge, huge. It took me, actually, it took me quite a long time to realize how much it impacted me until one time my sister, who's eight years younger, and I were talking about zero to seven growing up and realized how exceptionally different our lives were. Um, by the time she was born, 1950, late 1950, my father was the mayor. We built a new house at the far end of 8th Street to the south. Um, that she lived in the rest of her life. My dad was settled. He was starting businesses. He'd been named president of the ranch by my grandfather. So he had taken over management of it. So it was solid. When I was born, my dad, I was born about nine and a half months after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Uh, so we know this was not an accident. <laughs> this was uh, before dad went off to war. And I don't know, by the time I was four months old, he'd been transferred once and was transferred again. And so mother took me home to her parents in Thermopolis. So I spent the war in Thermopolis. And I lived with my grandmother and mother in the Plaza Hotel. If you go to the Plaza now, where the, the breakfast room is, was part of my grandmother's apartment where we lived. Mm. And sunny and beautiful, oh, it was so nice. And then my grandfather, they had a very bitter separation and didn't, I never saw them speak to each other. But my grandfather was across the street. So I would go over to my grandfather's place. And my grandmother being a nurse was, pretty casual about what I did. I can remember because we, in those days, little girls wore dresses with little puff sleeves and little puffy dresses. Nobody wore pants, none of the girls. And I had scabs all over my knees all the time because I was out playing and doing things like 
eating an anthill and my mother was so grossed out because the sound of the sand on my teeth and my grandmother apparently said, oh, Martha, it's just dirt. It's not going to hurt her. <laughs> so I was raised with this. And when my father came home, I think he came home with some PTSD. And when he did his oral history for the museum, he talked about always being restless, always being angry. So I was the kid, I got this and we, life changed drastically. Um, so he and his brother-in-law had a, a, a ranch up in Montana outside of Miles City. And after dad came back from war, then he sold it. They sold it, not he, they both sold it. And dad was going to take the money and move, to, move us to South America. So one of my big memories is my mother and grandmother taking my little brother and me, he'd been born by then. Dad took off with Jim Kelly, one of his good friends from Worland and uh, a bachelor and went looking for a ranch. And so I can remember my dad stepping off the plane and being surprised to see him again. Remember, I grew up in a hotel where people would stay and then they'd leave and then they'd come back or they never came back and then they'd leave. And so my whole life was people coming and going and going someplace interesting, like to be the masseuse for the New York Giants in Mesa, Arizona, or being in war. So my dad came back from South America felt like he was back in wartime Italy with the very rich and lots of poor and hunger and corruption. Anyway, so he came back and then we settled in Worland. And um, when did they, but he already had the ranch that you, that you're still in your family at this point? My grandfather, my grandfather, oh. My great grandfather didn't believe in owning land. Okay. He believed in keeping your capital liquid. And then he went into uh, banking, my, my grandfather's father. So my, fa my grandfather went into banking and then he left the First National and opened his own livestock uh, loan business. And the depression, he worked really hard, I'm told, so that farmers that owned him money and ranchers that owned him money wouldn't lose their farms and ranches. And the, the stress became so bad that he had a heart attack. So he closed down his livestock loan business and the LU, uh, the founder had, had died and the ranch was in bad shape and it was the middle of the depression. So my grandfather was able to buy the controlling shares. It was a public corporation, but the controlling shares in, in the LU. So that maybe was 1935 or something like that. A long time. Um no, it doesn't seem like one of the old ranches to me. Isn't that funny? Well, it's probably one of the older ones, isn't it? When, when did, well, when it's did, an older one, but not necessarily owned by my family. Oh, oh, I but then as mean. but my my brother's son, oldest son, DJ Daniel John, named after his grandfather's, is now president of the ranch and part owner and running it. And he says to me, that's my great grandfather that bought it, Aunt Kathy. <laughs> it's old <laughs> to me. Wow. Um, if we skip ahead a little bit to elementary school, what was your experience in, oh, maybe in kindergarten? You went to kindergarten, didn't you? Oh, that was controversial, it turns out. Mrs. Cannon oh. had a private kindergarten. 
And I think in Joni's, in Joni's uh, oral history, she mentioned going to it. I went to it, Rick Hake went to it. I think Bruce Kimsey went to it. I don't know who all was in our, our, our little class, but we learned to read and we learned to do numbers. Now, can you imagine how frustrating for the first grade teachers in Worland to have all these kids that could read and do numbers and all these kids that couldn't read and couldn't do numbers. And then what on earth are you supposed to do to get them all moving along at the same pace? So, but I didn't know that. And I liked Mrs. Cannon's kindergarten and I really liked first grade, but I have to say, so Worland was having an oil boom. By the time we were, from the time we were born, conceived, but from the time we were conceived to the time we were in the second grade, Worland's population more than doubled. We were the sixth largest city in the state. Can you imagine? We were 4,200 and some people. We weren't like Gillette with the Gillette syndrome many years later when they had their oil and coal boom because they had all these single men and all these vulnerable families move in and it just crashed the schools, crashed the social services, crashed the police force. It was a huge problem. We had post-World War II families that were building houses, buying houses. They weren't building and buying apartments. So we had all these kids coming in and they didn't have enough schools. So our class, and I think it must have been the kids that were living south of Main Street, went to the high school for first grade. And we weren't in a deep basement. It was a semi-basement because the windows were big because we would climb up on Rick Hake's desk and crawl out the window for the fire drills. <laughs> <laughs> And we had Mrs. Dyer. I must have liked Mrs. Dyer a lot because in the class picture out on the steps of the high school, I was standing right next to her. So that indicates to me that my memories of liking her were very accurate. But she taught me, she taught me one of the most valuable academic skills ever, but inadvertently because we had Dick Jane and their dog Spot books for reading books. And I was always so curious. I couldn't wait to know what was going to happen next, but we had to put a rubber band around our book where we were reading and each student would take turns reading out loud, which just took forever. So I developed the ability to put my finger where I really was take the rubber band off, flip over, read two or three pages really, really fast, and then put the rubber band on for the next page for the student to continue, which is how I learned to speed read. Wow. <laughs> and I still crank through stuff really fast, thanks to Mrs. Dyer. A good skill. Um, how about in second grade, were you still in the high school in second grade? No, we we all went to the Watson School, which was on 10th Street, the famous 10th Street, where my grandparents lived and Joni lived by and my cousins and Eleanor Dent in the library. So if you go north on 10th Street, there was the Watson building and then the old Emmett building. And first and second graders were in the Watson building and third and fourth graders were in the Emmett building. And that was the first time we'd merged, we on the South Side merged with all the kids in town. So second grade, we had a teacher who was a bully. She was really A memorable teacher for all the wrong reasons. And you 
and Lane and I have talked about our memories and it was a terrible year. She had a black hose, curved black hose section that she'd walk around and whack it on her desk. And she had a hard ruler, probably like this with a metal edge and she would hit people, especially hit their hands. And in particular, I don't think, I don't remember ever seeing her use the hose on somebody, but she used that ruler and she would do it. She wasn't just tapping, she would really whack. And there was one boy in particular that I've heard subsequently used to tug on somebody's long braids or something. So he was not completely innocent. But basically, she would come at him, and we all knew he hadn't done something. And we were helpless. We had, I don't even think we much talked about it, except Dennis Bauer was in the other classroom, and he said, oh, we all knew about her. But tradition in those days was your parents said, you have to mind the teacher. It's your fault, not the teacher's fault. You must not be minding. So it was second grade was quite a year. It certainly was. <laughs> Is there anything that you remember about elementary school that particularly amuses you when you think of it now? Let me think. <laughs> There's something I love. <laughs> we had another bully teacher. I'm going to tell you about the wonderful teachers next. <laughs> but we had another bully in the fifth grade. And she would humiliate, publicly shame students that made the entire class traumatized. We really were traumatized because we were older and we were still helpless. And one day, which I never knew until years later, my very good friend now, Lane Bailey, was eating. She told me a few years ago, she was eating. She had a pear that she had on her desk that she was going to eat. And Mrs. Chapman took out after her about something that was very unfair. And Lane got so mad, she picked up her pear and threw it at her, barely missed her. It splattered all over the blackboard. And Lane said, Mrs. Chapman looked so startled. And then she stopped what she was doing to Lane because Lane said she knew she was out of bounds. Now, the interesting thing about that story, so I think that's hilarious. I think that's the bravest thing in my entire elementary school that anybody did. Lane got in so much trouble at home because her mother was a teacher. And so of course she heard about all this right away. So it wasn't until I started ranting about how brave Lane was and she was the only one with any courage we just all gossiped and complained she took action so I think that was very funny now I think so too what happened was Mrs. Chapman got pregnant and in those days you couldn't be pregnant and be a teacher now, Gretchen Bauer and I figured that she got pregnant deliberately because she didn't want to be around us any more than we wanted to be around her. This was our theory, never proven. <laughs> we ended up with the most wonderful teacher, Pearl Marie Mesta, and she loved us. She thought we were wonderful. She thought we were fabulous. She thought we were funny. She thought we had great courage and moral values and she just and we blossomed <laughs> we just blossomed and by sixth grade when I had Mrs. Foster 
This is Foster Tata's world history. And she loved stories. And we learned about Hannibal and the elephants going over the Alps. And we learned about Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat cake when all the people were starving and she got her head chopped off. We heard the most wonderful stories. And I discovered I have a talent for learning and remembering people's stories, which was, has been invaluable to me in my career. You want to talk a little bit about the career that you had? That I became a newspaper reporter. I became a novelist, published novelist. Um, I became a magazine editor in chief. So, and to this day, I'm as a retiree, 15, 16 year retiree now, I'm helping people tell, tell their stories to a, a, an audience in, in the world. Including so, this project. Including this project, yes. Right. If, we, if we go on to junior high, what was your experience like moving from elementary school to junior high? It's when I learned to not be part of my body. <laughs> wow. It was horrible. It was just horrible. Wow. Um, I was born with cross eyes. My father didn't believe in surgery. So we went to all these different specialists in Denver and in Billings. And for years I spent, my mother and I spent 30 minutes every morning doing eye exercises to strengthen my eyes so I could hold it straight. And the summer before we started seventh grade where suddenly there were all these kids from that were basically strangers um, gathering together. The doctor, the eye doctor in Billings said, we're going to try something. We want her eyeglasses, this part from here to here and here to here to be painted black so that if her eye wanders, it'll jump back. So I started seventh grade looking like a freak. That's a hard time to feel like a freak. <laughs> it's a terrible time to feel like a freak. How long did it oh. last? Oh, I don't I mean, know. How long did you? Uh, Maybe did two years, a year or two. I can't remember. Pretty much. What, I loved, what I loved about seventh grade is there were teachers there. I suppose it was be, by being old Worland. Because Mrs. Myers was the character of the school. She popper girdle and you know, I mean, there were all these things about Mrs. Myers. But Mrs. Myers, first year of teaching, she'd had my father, she'd had Rick Hake, father, she had Grant Ejifuse's father, she had Gretchen Bauer's father. They were all in the same class. They graduated from high school together. So she knew all of us because she knew all of our dads. She was Miss Sunny in those days. And Mrs. Myers did us such a favor and about scared us to death, which is, I sound like I was afraid all through junior high. <laughs> I think I probably was. Mrs. Myers made us, I can't remember if it was every month, every six weeks, we had poems we had to memorize. And do you remember this, Joan? And we'd stand in front of the class and have to recite the poem. Each one of us, one after another, after another. And I, I thought, remember, um, what? I remember doing that in fifth grade. I don't, I think I had this teacher you're talking about. I thought everybody had her. Well, anyway, I thought some of the boys might just drop dead on the spot, or they certainly wish they could. And so one night I was 
I was learning, we were learning the opening and closing of Evangeline by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Mm -hmm. This is the for forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded in moss and in garments green, stand indistinct in the twilight. And my grandfather Haley was widowed by then and living with us. And he started to join in, stand like druids of eld. <laughs> and I said, Grandfather, did you have Mrs. Myers too? Wow. <laughs> but he what had about... to memorize it when he was in school in Ogden. Well, how about moving on to high school? Is there anything else about uh, middle, junior high you'd like to mention? Or should we move on to high school? Let's jump back for a minute to elementary okay. school. Okay. Because I had something that profoundly affect, has affected me my whole life as well as my career. So, so there was my dad wanting to buy a a ranch in, in um, South America somewhere, and then decided not to. But in the meantime, in 1946, there, there's all the sirens. Um, in 1946, my grandparents went down to Central America and Brazil. Um, or maybe, anyway, a couple of times when I was little, my grandparents would take two or three month winter holidays to South America and they'd bring back dolls, which I still have, and little costumes and things like that. So South America was on my mind as exotic. So the Christmas of 1949, Korean War was heating up and my father was a major in the Army, Re Army Air Force Reserves and they were starting to make squeaks about calling people up and uh, for the Korean War. And by, right before Christmas, my grandmother Haley was diagnosed with with uh, terminal colon cancer and was told she'd be dead in about six weeks, six months. And then in February, on Lincoln's birthday, my grandmother Omens had died suddenly from a heart attack. So my poor parents were hitting every one of life's main stresses. So they decided to get out of town and go where the flowers bloom. So they took my little brother, Mike and me to Mexico. And we stayed right in the central square of Mexico City. And <laughs> that's when we were still living at 809 Culbertson. And our room was practically bigger than the whole house. It was a pretty small house on Culbertson. And the National Cathedral, and I climbed the pyramids, and the floating gardens were really the floating gardens. And then we drove through the desert to Acapulco, where we saw little burros with bananas strapped to them. And, and what I observed was that Mexico had an extraordinary culture. I had never seen anything like downtown Mexico City. And my grandparents, my omens and grandparents had taken me to LA and they'd taken me to San Francisco. I'd been to Denver. So I'd seen cities. I'd never seen anything like this. And the pyramids were unbelievable. So I developed a very different attitude about Mexico based on my own personal experience. And 
I became a Latin Americanist. So it totally impacted my career. And right now I'm on the international board of a group called Partners of the Americas, which was inspired by John Kennedy with people to people programs in Latin America doing community development projects and art projects and the eco camp in a village on the shores of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, which I'm working on right now. So in the second grade, I was transformed. Despite Mrs. Sisk, and I'm gonna say her <laughs> name, may she rest <laughs> in peace. Right. <laughs> so what about moving on to high school? Do you remember any memories from high school? Oh, we were all so busy. That's Remember right. how busy we were. We had the football games and the basketball games. And I wasn't on debate because I'm kind of chicken. For as brave a life as people think I live, I am I operate from chicken time <laughs> sometimes. So but I was in the thespian, so I did drama and um and I did competition 4-H sewing. And I did make it yourself with wool contest. And we had, we had so many activities and our parents were so engaged in our activities, so supportive. They drove us to games. They, they encouraged us, they went to the, they helped us with the practices. And above all of that, Worland was organized by churches. So Wednesday night was sacred. Nothing was scheduled except church youth groups. And I think, so when you think about it, There were lots of keeping to your own. There wasn't, in lots of ways, there wasn't as much mixing as they, there probably is now. So that interracial marriage, interracial marriage, interracial, interracial dating was frowned on. Um, and not done for the most part, or it wasn't done publicly. Um, Lane had a, was crazy about a guy that was Catholic. She was a Methodist. Why did her parents put the kibosh on that? And his parents probably did too. Um, I was telling a friend here who's a historian and is taught at GW University in history. And I was saying that a lot of the friendships were south of, my friendships were south, most of them were south of Main Street. And he said, well, was north of Main Street like a lower class part of town? I said, no, it just was on the other side of Main Street. I said it was the other side of the tracks that the kids whose families were struggling more. As far as I knew, there probably were families struggling all over the city. I don't know what that has to do with anything other than there were, you know, the future farmers stuck to themselves and the and you didn't want to be too smart. I remember Robin Evans. His name was Robin Evans. Robin was his first name. And he, Evans might have been his mother's maiden name. He scored really high on an IQ test or something, some big test. And he told me that he didn't want anybody to know because he'd get so much grief for it. So that there were lots of barriers you didn't cross. 
But on the other hand, what we had is, I really think unique to Wyoming because there are so few people, is going to games in other places, doing all these activities where you'd have district meets and state meets and you go down to Laramie because you, we had the one four-year university, which I still think is a really wise idea because it gives a, an emotional center to the state. Um, anyway, so I think of high school as lots and lots and lots of activities. Um, did you work during high school? I started working at my dad's music store in the eighth grade. I was, wow. the, I was the janitor. And after a while, I got to order records. And I, of course, was so excited because we'd all watch American Bandstand, so we knew which records were hot, knew what the dances were. I, I, I couldn't do them very well. My friend Elnor Dent could do all those dances, but I was kind of had trouble figuring them out. Uh, and, and then I, I worked, in, I did the janitor thing and I'd wash the windows every Saturday and I kept the place clean after schools, after school. Um, but the end of my junior year, no, the end of my sophomore year, I quit because I was, I signed up for college prep chemistry from Mr. Schwartz and you had to do a lot of lab work after school. I don't know how the kids did sports and did Mr. Schwartz's chemistry class. Anyway, the joke always was that I had to work two more weeks to pay for the amount of money I owed for all the records I bought. <laughs> Do you remember anything about what we wore? Oh my God, we dressed so stupid. <laughs> First of all, we were not allowed to wear pants. No pants. And we wore bobby socks, which made an awful lot of, bobby socks were thick socks, thick white socks that you would fold over. So there'd be this big, thick donut thing around your ankles. So that unless you had little slimmy, slim ankles, it just made, Fat ankles look fatter. And then people wore white bucks. Oh my God, how would you keep those white bucks clean and white? That was, um, um, and the girls, there was a lot of Janssen sweaters and Pendleton skirts and Janssen sweaters. Oh, I only had a couple. My parents let me, I think I had one Pendleton skirt and two Janssen sweaters. It was, I was held to strong limits on how many I could have. But the Janssen sweaters, people would wear in and then they'd wear way high belts. And if you were one of the well-endowed girls, you looked like Lana Turner or something. I mean, it was really sexy. Um, if you weren't, <laughs> If you were like me, that in the sixth grade, I had to wear suspenders to hold up my skirts because I didn't have enough hips difference between my hips and my waist. So I'd wear a blouse over my suspenders and then a sweater, pullover sweater over the blouse so that nobody would know I was wearing suspenders. Anyway, these styles. And then we had crinolines. Is that what we call them, crinolines? And you soak them in so. water so they'd stick out. And you said you got cuts on your knees from them. I just remember getting sweaty, especially in math class, because I'd get nervous. And they'd start sticking to you. Oh. <laughs> in the, but I in the... really remember about how stupid we were with what we wore. That's true. Is one day, it was 46 degrees below zero. This was not wind chill. This was straight temperature. It was the coldest anybody had ever seen. We had to walk to school. Now, I don't know. I'm sure some kids got rides. I didn't get a ride. So 
I bundled up and I had my skirt and my stupid bobby socks and um, my nose, it was so cold, your nose would pinch together. So you're like this because they didn't have gaiters in those days. So you're like this. And I ran over to Judy Van's house, picked her up, warmed up inside. Then she and I ran to Sharon Kleinschmidt's house over by Sanders Park. Then we ran to the high school. Why didn't we wear pants? Why didn't we say, make us go home? We're wearing pants. It never occurred to us. I don't know anyone. I didn't even, I just heard people complaining how cold they were. I don't think, did you hear anybody saying, why didn't they let us wear pants? It seems to me that they let you wear pants if there was a saddle pants, if there was a football game that day. That could be. I think if there was a football game, because that was kind of the uniform for if you were school spirit. The team. Yeah, you, wore, you had those black saddle pants. In fact, my mother still had mine when we cleaned out her house when she died. <laughs> they were wool. They were really warm. Why didn't they let us wear them? And no mothers would buy their kids stockings. And they didn't have like tights then. So no, we were cold. It was bleeding knees from the colonel. Um, Kathy, did you if want you were to, to ask me, if you were to ask me something funny that happened in high school? Right. I joined Job's Daughters. And you had to wear white stockings. I and didn't remember that. Oh yeah, you wore white stockings because then you had these Grecian gowns that with the tie robe and all this okay. stuff. And you needed garter belts. Well, garter belts were just kind of gross and uncomfortable. Could have been more uncomfortable. But anyway, Sylvia Burgess told Judy Van and me, was it Judy Van or Eleanor Dent? I think it must have been Eleanor. And she said, you can just twist a knot on top of the white stockings and they'll hold it up. You don't have to wear a garter belt. <laughs> <laughs> so the marching, the marching around started. <laughs> we marched and marched and you do all these things where you turn corners and you double dip and you do this stuff. <laughs> I could feel the stockings starting to fall down. And pretty soon, they're on my ankles, and I'm starting to practically not try not to trip on them. Meanwhile, Mr. Wellman was the guardian, the male guardian of the chapter, whatever they called it. And <laughs> he was the most straight laced person in the universe. We all knew how straight laced he was, and he had a rigid, had great posture, and all this. And he just sat there and he didn't look at us. He just looked <laughs> straight at him. And we, kept, <laughs> and we sat down and we had to get up and march around and do some more stuff. It was, it was so embarrassing. I don't know why Sylvia like Burgess didn't have hers fall down. She was, a, what was she, one class ahead? I think she was a class ahead of us. How about television? Did you watch television at all when you were growing up? We didn't have television in for quite a while. I remember when they were first promoting cable. Right. And we drove out to some little hilltop out in the Badlands, and there was this little shack. And then we sat there and watched kind of snowy television because it was black and white. But my father started selling television sets right away at the Broadbent and Haley Music Store. So we, of course, had to have a television set right away. Uh, sure. Maybe that was why one of the reasons you started the music store. My dad loved to start new businesses. My dad loved it. Anyway, so we had the music store and we had the television. So we always had television. And how did it impact our lives? One way it impacted it is Every Sunday at eight o'clock, we would watch Maverick. We all loved Maverick. Uh, 
So we had shows that we would all watch together. And to this day, I don't watch much television. I think because I feel lonely if I sit by myself and watch television. I'm used to being with the family. But I think we all must have watched Maverick because I remember kids on Monday morning talking about telling the jokes. Hmm. My sister what? went into TV. My sister has no memories of life without television. She's eight years younger, my sister Debbie. And she ended up um, being a producer and a host uh, for Wyoming PBS. Wow. So she loves television. Kathy, what experiences of growing up in Worland created most impact on your life? I know you talked about your um, writing and being an editor and a reporter, but were there other things that, other activities that were created by your experiences in New Orleans? Let's see, I think, I can think of several. One of them is 4-H. I think all mm. kids that participated in 4-H learned to do things in a consistent way with a goal to be excellent and to be judged on your excellence. I think that was really important. When I, when I was writing novels for a living, it was just like sitting by myself, sewing an outfit, paying attention to every detail and then being stuck with the last 10%, which takes, what is it they say? The last 20% takes 80% of your energy to finish, but finishing right. it because you had the, the Washington County Fair coming up, you, had, you wanted to get to state fair. So I think 4-H was critically important. Um, I think another thing that is a huge impact is the power, the personal power you feel by growing up in a place where there aren't very many people so that you personally can make an impact. I was in college before I realized it was a very big deal to have even seen your senator, letting, let alone having met him. There were always hymns in those days. But across the alley and across the street was Dennis O'Manny, who was a year, year or two younger, younger than we were. But his great uncle that would come visit was Senator O'Manny. So it was just like, oh, Dennis O'Manny's uncle's here. It, and I don't think that's because I was in such an elite little slice of Worland. I think Wyoming is like that. And I think Wyoming, because people are so connected, it gave me, my friends tease me because I go to places and I, often have the assumption that we have the people I'm meeting, we have something in common. It's just, what is it? And it usually is true, or it's often true, but I think it's just because in Wyoming, it is true. That's true. I agree with you. Living in a large metropolitan area, very different from growing up in a small, compact kind of community. Um, I think you learn really? also, I think, I think you learn also um, 
the people you, that you don't necessarily agree with politically are good people who right. are generous and do good things for you and others. And for the community. I think you learn, gosh, I see some of the kids in the suburbs here in Washington who've never met and actually had conversations with people that don't come from their income bracket and their parents and grandparents level of elite education. They've, they have not a clue about other people. Sure. We, we knew everybody. Right. Do you wish that you had some learning opportunities as a young person in Worland that, was, that were not available to you? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. I've been thinking about this question because there's so many things. So let me, let me limit. First, I wish we'd known about dyslexia. I don't even know if the word existed then. It probably did. But we kids had never heard of it. The teachers had never heard of it. Now, teachers are taught how to teach kids who see words in reverse how to read. Now, their classmates are also taught, and they're taught, that people with dyslexia reading backwards have exceptional spatial abilities. So that now people know that Niels Bohr, who conceived of the structure of the atom, and would get excited when he was writing formulas and sometimes would start writing in reverse on the blackboard because he was so dyslexic. But people like Niels Bohr was dyslexic. We had a classmate in the fourth grade that couldn't read. I remember. And I'm ashamed to say I couldn't figure out why he couldn't read. So I concluded he was kind of a dummy. Here's something else I wish we'd had. Let me look up my notes. <laughs> what to do to stop bullying. Mm. We knew the word, we saw the word, we knew who were the ones, we guessed who were the ones probably being bullied. Mostly boys, I think girls were, had sneaky ways of doing, messing with your mind. Um, now they not only know about bullying, they talk about bullying and they teach kids what to do if they're being bullied, if they see people being bullied. And okay, so the correct, the correct uh, phrase for bullying is apparently your peers. So the bully teacher in the second grade wasn't a bully, but in my mind, she was a bully. Mm. And if we kids had known how you can fight a bully, we might have done something and she might have been shocked at how we perceived what she was doing. Like when Mrs. Chapman, when Lane threw the pear at her, she fought back. Well, we just sat like, <laughs> scared little mice. And the third thing I wish they'd had are real aptitude tests. They gave us an interest test in high school and I think half the people ended up that they were interested in being tractor mechanics or something. They were all kind of goofy, goofy results. But real aptitude tests where they measure 
and test discrete skills, open your brain to what you think is just normal that, well, you're exceptionally good in that, but you're exceptionally bad at this. So if you're like me, you're exceptionally good at ideas and generating ideas. The flip side is you have a hard time to focus because you still have all these <laughs> ideas. Aptitude tests were so valuable, have been so valuable to me, but not until I was in my 40s. Oh, mm. it would have been so great in high school. Kathy, is there anything else you'd like to talk about um, that you can think of in closing? If I were to give some wisdom. Okay. In my career, I discovered that what I was doing for fun in high school became my profession. It wasn't a profession in those days, so there's no way I could have known that this would happen. I became the president. My family were Unitarian, and because the nearest Unitarian church was 500 miles away, uh, we belonged to a church in Boston that was a correspondence church for people like us. And I became the president of our high school youth group in, I think my junior year, could have been my senior year. Anyway, certainly by that summer. <clears throat> and there were 70 members of the youth group and they were all over the world. And I wrote to every single one of them and lots of them wrote back to me and we were writing back and forth. And once a month I wrote a column in the newsletter that would be sent out. That's called community communications. My last job was for the National Geographic Society and it was basically commu community communication. It was interacting and getting the word out and getting the stories out for all the people that worked for National Geographic. And today, here I am figuring out how to get the word out on how you set up eco camps in traditional villages so that they don't trash the sacred lake Titicaca or they don't understand why you need forests in the rainforest or the springs will dry up and you can't irrigate your farms and you don't have water for your animals. It all went back to, by chance, becoming president of this high school youth group. That became my career. And as a volunteer, as a 16 year retiree, it's still my career. You're still going strong. <laughs> well, should we knock on wood in every direction? <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Uh, for generations to come, lots of people will listen to the wisdom that you've given us. And we like to thank you for participating, not only for participating, but for spearheading this project. Thank Isn't you. it fun? Haven't we had a good it time? Is, and learned. Have. Oh my gosh, what we have learned. Thank you. Kathy, your grandmother had some interesting thing, um, activities. Uh, something that she was doing involved the Girl Scouts. Would you like to talk about that? Yes, and I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't put it in earlier. I think, I think a life lesson is you never quite know what things will come your way and it will move and grow and give you um, a new lease on life. So when my grandmother and grandfather adopted the two girls, they were 
first grade and third grade. And by then my dad was in the, uh, my uncle Alec was in the eighth grade, I think, and my dad was maybe sixth grade, fifth grade, something like that. And having the girls got my grandmother, I think, I think it, it, it totally inspired her because then she started thinking, okay, how can I help the girls meet friends? How can we do something that will integrate them? How can we do something that will uh, teach them some social skills and some self-confidence and learn other kinds of skills? And my grandmother loved camping in the sheep wagon when she was first married. And she loved being up at the cabin with the wood stove. And these were all these kinds of things Girl Scouts did. And so she got involved with the Girl Scouts because of my aunt Helen and my aunt Eileen. And pretty soon my grandmother started, got very enthusiastic and she started selling the Girl Scouts. She started recruiting leaders all over the basin. They eventually start calling her the Juliet Lowe of the Bighorn Basin. Juliet Lowe being the woman that founded Girl Scouts in the United States. And at one point she'd gotten, there were about a thousand girls in the Bighorn Basin that were involved in scouting. And so, you know, I think about it and, I, it, it, and her father was a master salesman. He, he had an insurance company, his own insurance agency. And you read about what a great salesman he was. Well, I think she must have inherited that because then they put her on the, the regional Girl Scout board and then she ended up on the national Girl Scout board. So there she was flying off from, or taking the train or however she did it, off from Worland, Wyoming. And she'd go to the National Girl Scout meeting with Mrs. Lou Henry Hoover and Mrs. Harvey Mudd, who's the one that started Harvey Mudd College, which, which is considered even more difficult to get into now than MIT and Caltech. <laughs> and, and there's my grandmother with all these people coming from Worland, Wyoming. Lou Henry Hoover even came to visit her once, her, them. Anyway, it all started by figuring out what to do with the two daughters that, that she'd adopted. My mother, now there's a funny thing about my mother. My mother was known in Wyoming for her beauty. She was Miss Wyoming. Lady. She was Miss Wyoming. After she graduated, she she went to first. She started at Colorado Women's College because my grandmother was afraid the girls in that time would were getting pregnant senior year in high school because they were starting to have fun. And the boys had cars, and anyway, she didn't want my mother in that situation. So she sent her off to a Baptist college, Colorado Women's College. So she was there for a year. Then she transferred to Laramie. Then she went home for, she was there for a couple of years. And as you, as I mentioned, both of her parents had hotels. So she ended up going to Cornell to the hotel school, which I don't know if it still is ranked like that, but in those days it was ranked with Switzerland for the best hotel schools in the world. And they were, they met, it was called hotel engineering and they met in the engineering college at Cornell. So my mother ended up with a bachelor of science degree in engineering. Huh. My mother knew how to live in a small town. So hardly anybody knew this. And one time, uh, one of the Girl State friends, Kathy Carpen, that I don't since Girl State, Kathy Carbon came to give a talk to the, this is a professional women group. 
And so mother said, oh, well, your friend Kathy's coming. Let's go out. So we were sitting there and different people at the table were talking about what they'd studied in college. And my mother said nothing because that's what my mother usually did about these things. So I, Miss Blabbermouth said, do you know my mother has an engineering degree from Cornell? And their jaws all dropped. And they said, you do? I didn't know you went to college, Martha. Well, yes, she's <laughs> kind of trying to like. Anyway, my mom was really special. After she graduated from Cornell, the World's Fair was going to be going on in San Francisco and they hired her as Miss Wyoming. So she had all these fabulous, she had these great cowgirl outfits and leather and one was white with black trim and another brown one and all these you know the little silk shirts and all this stuff it was strange to to have a mother that was a known beauty uh i've talked about the advantage of being in wyoming well one time i was in laramie i must have been about 16 must have been down there for some state meet. And I met some couple and the man said to me, you're Martha Omanson's daughter. She's the most beautiful woman in Wyoming. I used to walk three blocks out of my way at UW so that I could watch her walk to class. Then long pause. And he said, you must look like your father. <laughs> So I, of course, took it into my heart and pondered it and felt bad. <laughs> you know, all those things. Well, in fact, I do look like the Haley side of the family. <laughs> but um, anyway, my mom was, my mom was really exceptional. She was so intuitive that she was practically psychic. Grant always used, mm -hmm. Grant used a few, so always used to call her up and say, take a look at this and what do you think? Because she would give him what the common reaction would be. She mm -hmm. just would sush it out. Anyway, that's more than enough. Well, that's really interesting. Anything else you'd like to add? Nah, there's too much. Okay, that's it. <laughs> There are lots Thanks. of wonderful things about growing up in Worland. That's those are some of them. Right. Thank you. Oh yes. And about my grandmother with this Girl Scouting. She was buried in her Girl Scout dress uniform. And after she was gone, she had been going around the basin helping get what they the Girl Scouts called little houses and little houses were where they could meet because in those days my grandmother died in 1950 but in those days they didn't have community centers well we had the community center in Worland but it was too big and it wasn't set up for kids to meet so she wanted a place that, and the Girl Scouts nationally were pushing it for these little houses. So after she died, my grandfather donated money so that a little house could be built in Worland in the name of my grandmother. So it's the Edith Sampson Haley Little House. I remember going to Girl Scout meetings there. And I think Joanne in her, in her, um, Joanne Culbertson in, in her oral history also mentioned it. And I went to, I went to Girl Scout meetings there too. I didn't find nice Girl legacy. Scouts really compelling, but it took me about two years after my grandmother died before I had the courage to ask my father if I could quit Girl Scouts and join the 4-H. Well, that's a nice organization too. Yeah.